It's lovely to hear people worshipping God passionately. It's lovely to hear that we're on the offensive, not the defensive, which I hope will translate somewhat into what we're saying this morning. What we're finding in our year-long series on the kingdom of God, in this part of it particularly, is that when God is king, his people are radically transformed. Radically transformed by new values, by a new model in Jesus Christ. We're finding that we're people who trust, who grow, who give, who share, who multiply. And kingdom people this morning relate to one another in new ways because God is king. Do you know this? The New Testament, in fact the whole Bible, but the New Testament then knows nothing of solitary Christianity. You know, you've met that person who says, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church. They've absolutely and fundamentally missed New Testament Christianity. The New Testament knows nothing of life with God apart from life in the family of God. God loves and saves people personally. That's the wonder of the Christian faith. He picked you, he picked you, he picked you, he's chosen you, he saved you. Christ died for you. And yet, everyone personally rescued by Jesus is incorporated into his family. I wonder if you've ever made this mistake. I did once. I once, this is a long time ago, I know better now said to someone who was really struggling in their Christian faith, I said, if you were the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. Now you're wondering why that's not right, aren't you? It's not right because, well, it's such hypothetical nonsense, it makes no sense anyway. You weren't the only person in the world. Jesus didn't just die for you. But it's also a very, very, very Western, narrow, individualistic view of Christian faith. Jesus loves you. Never mind everybody else. He loves you. And if everybody else didn't exist, he'd still have loved you. Yes, but you're missing the whole thrust of the New Testament, that he loves us and joins you to us. And it's in that context. So don't try and boost someone's self-esteem with that load of nonsense like I did once upon a time. Why, why are we saved into the church community? Why are we saved into the church family? Because God is perfect community in Trinity. And so if we're going to be anything like him, we'll be in community. Secondly, because God is building a people, a family, not random individuals, but the universal worldwide people of God and local expressions of that, like this one and our community in Southbourne. And thirdly, why? Because it is through his redeemed people that he is showing the world what he's like. You're on a mission tomorrow. As soon as we step out of here, we're doing the most of the work that we have as Christians. And you'll be in work tomorrow, and you'll be in your neighborhood tomorrow, and so on. But it is through, also through the community that God is showing us what, God is showing the world what he's like. You will be my witnesses, Jesus said. Plural. Jesus said, also, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. It's you personally, and it's us together shining the light of Jesus wherever we go. So the entire New Testament is relational. It works like this. New life comes. There's power to live a new lifestyle. And you are incorporated in a new community, which is exactly what we're going to see in our passage today in Colossians chapter 3. Colossae was a town that the Apostle Paul didn't go to as far as we know. It's in modern-day Turkey. But he'd heard, in the New Testament days, he'd heard there was a church started there. And so he wrote to them. And part of what he wrote to them 
was chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, which moved through that progression. New life leads to new lifestyle, leads to new community. We're going to read 17 verses. You're getting your money's worth today. 17 verses. Here we go. You might want to open your Bible, or it's on the screen. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's new life. New lifestyle. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, in this new community, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, new community, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if anyone has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, Whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That is magnificent. This passage illustrates a very, very important principle in Christian living and Christian relating. It's this. Indicatives before imperatives. At which point, do not switch off. (laughs) This is very, very important. Indicatives before imperatives. In the Bible, indicatives are statements of what God has done and declares to be. Indicatives. Imperatives, on the other hand, are because of the, the indicatives, what God has done, what he's declared. These are commands to us. It's an imperative that you do this or become this. In other words, we live out what God has done and declared. And we do that not just as individuals, we do that as a community, indicatives before imperatives. And this principle, indicatives before imperatives, has huge implications for how we relate to one another. As we see in Colossians 3, where what God says and declares drives how we relate to one another. So take this, for example, in verse 12. Therefore, is this a statement or a command? Therefore, this bit, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, is that an indicative or an imperative? Indicative, it's a statement. This is what you are. You're holy. You're dearly loved. You're chosen. Because of that, clothe yourselves. Here's the imperative. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And sometimes it's put the other way around. He gives the imperative. Here's what you must do because of what God has done. So verse 13 is one of those. Forgive. Is that a command or an indicative? Forgive. Forgive. It's a command. This is what you must do as or in the same way as the Lord forgave you. 
The indicative drives the imperative. The imperative, here's what we must do. Well, just to be nice. No, no, no. The the church never runs by, well, we ought to be nice. The church runs and behaves and relates because this is what God has done. And this is what he has made you to be. Verse 15, we've got another one the other way around. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Imperative or indicative? Imperative. This is what you must do. But there's a reason. Because as members, here's the indicative, of one body, you were called to peace. Why should we be at peace with one another? Just to be nice. No, 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 no. Not at all. You're one body. Imagine if the members of my body were at war with one another. You think, something's gone fundamentally wrong. It's not just that the body is not being nice. Something fundamentally has gone wrong. Be at peace with one another because you were called to this because you're one body. So we relate to one another in the kingdom of God, not only on these bases. Not only because of what we think people deserve. Imagine if I treated David as I thought he deserved. He'd be in a bad way. Be looking pretty ugly for him. We do not relate to people only on the basis of what they deserve, nor do we relate to people only on the basis of how they have related to us. If I said to Kerry over here, the principle on which I'm going to relate to you is I will be to you as you have been to me. <laughs> what would that look like, Kerry? <laughs> It's not going to work very well. Actually, uh, David and Kerry are lovely. I'm playing. Nor, ultimately, dare I say, do we relate to each other only on the basis of what Jesus said. Do to others what you would have them do to you. If I related to Phil on the basis of, now how would I like him to behave to me. This is a great principle. How would I like him to behave to me? Well, I will behave to him. Yes, that's a great principle. But the principle here is even greater. Kingdom people relate to one another on the basis of what God has done and declared. So I'm not going to forgive Phil even on the basis of how would I like him to forgive me? I'll forgive him. It's God, what have you done to me? That's my command to live out in community. And this, all of this, is going to lead to some pretty radical ways of relating. Here are three. Firstly, in the kingdom of God, we clothe ourselves with Christ. Verse 12 says. Now verse 12 starts with a therefore. You know what to do with a therefore, don't you? You have to find out what it's there for, obviously. What he's saying is, at the start of verse 12, because of all that I've been saying in verses 1 to 11, do this. But especially in view of how I've finished the previous statement. What does the previous statement in verse 11 finish with? Christ is all and is in all. So Paul is saying this, and Timothy actually, who wrote it too. Here is how relationships are conducted when God is king. Here's how relationships are conducted in this community full of new life, in this community where Christ is all and in all. God's chosen, holy, dearly loved people clothe themselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, getting dressed, in my experience, is always an intentional thing. You might want to have a look around and see if there's any exceptions to that. But it's usually an intentional thing. One gets dressed according to the situation that one is going into. If you're going to work, you dress in a certain way. If you're gardening, as I was yesterday, I took my shirt off and put a different one on that I didn't care less about. You have dressed appropriately. If you're playing sport, you get dressed in a certain way. If you're going to bed, you get dressed in another way. If you're doing DIY, I've got weddings to take in June, July, and August. I won't dress like this. I'll dress differently. I'll dress appropriately for those occasions. In each case, you dress 
for the occasion. It's a very, very similar thing here in verse 12. Given that you are God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved people, put on suitable ways of relating. Dress yourselves in attitudes and behavior befitting the people God loves and considers to be precious. Now, sometimes Jackie and I will go shopping. In fact, we did a week ago Saturday. Wimborne's got quite a few ladies' clothes shops, hasn't it? I thought it was this little village in the middle of nowhere with just a post office if you're lucky. No men's clothes shops, of course, but hey, that's just a burden that men have to bear in life, isn't it? Um, and um, we went around one of them, and she was trying on some stuff for some weddings coming up. But every now and again, we'll go shopping, and she'll try on some clothes, and she'll come out of the changing room, and she'll say, what do you think? <laughs> and you, if you're a husband, you'll know this is a very, very crucial moment in your relationship. <laughs> because the potential for saying the wrong thing, even the very slightest wrong thing, is enormous. And the consequences could last for weeks. In fact, to be fair, just in case she ever listens to this, Jackie is very good about that sort of thing. Uh, but she's asking for an opinion, and sometimes I'll say, that looks amazing. Actually, what she tried on last Saturday was amazing. And sometimes I'll, as nicely as I possibly can, say, uh, no. <laughs> Not that one. This passage is a fashion check in our relating together. Am I clothing myself in the way I relate to you appropriately given that you and I are dearly loved and holy and chosen? Now that you and I together are part of God's special people. That regulates how I'm going to relate to you. I wonder if you are committing a fashion faux pas when you gossip, when you have no interest in that person because they're just not your sort, when you complain behind someone's back, you are committing fashion faux pas. And what you need to do is to look in the Word of God, which is the mirror, and say, what do I... No, that's awful. I need to change some of my relational clothing. And this list, of course, is no list of arbitrary niceties. Guess who it sounds like? Any idea? Well, Romans 13, 14 tells us, or gives us a clue, clothe yourselves with or put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Kind, compassionate, loving, gracious. Here's a good question to ask whenever you're relating with somebody in, amongst God's people. What would Jesus put on here? Are the relational clothes I'm wearing the sort of ones that he would put on? Because let's face it, it's a challenge, isn't it? It's a very serious challenge with so many sorts of people, so many types of people, so many ages, so many backgrounds, so many all sorts. And yet, what a picture, what an extraordinary picture of the life of God displayed to the world this can show. I went to a museum in Madrid with Sam once, my oldest son, when he was about 14. And we went, Madrid seems to be full of museums. And some of them are great. And we went to this one art museum, and I've not really got a clue about art. Not the slightest idea. And we were walking around these, and some of them are, oh, that's all right. It's probably worth billions of pounds, and I just say it's all right. And we got to this one, and it was literally just a blob of this color, and a blob of that color, and a blob of this. I thought, what a mess. That's in a museum? And then what I noticed was, I'd been looking very close. And I stepped back a bit. Oh, right. And I stepped back a bit further. Oh, I see. That's amazing. What an artist. 
Have you ever looked at the church and thought, that's a funny blob. <laughs> What's that blob doing here? Well, I wouldn't put that color there. Funny blob, funny blob. And you step back, and you step back, and you step back, and you think, God, that is amazing. When people of all sorts, who would never otherwise have mixed together, clothed themselves with Christ. What an amazing community to be part of. What an amazing witness to the world that is so confused about relationships and so got no idea how to be community. In the kingdom of God, we clothe ourselves with Christ. We'll come back to that at the end. Secondly, in the kingdom of God... This just gets tougher, by the way. We forgive like Christ. Let me give you three facts for your life. Fact number one is this. Until the day you die, practicing forgiveness will be one of your greatest challenges. Fact number two. In this church you will have opportunity to forgive. Fact three, your long-term enjoyment of and contribution to church life will depend to a large extent on your decisions to truly forgive. Let me tell you, if you haven't had the opportunity for bitterness yet, it's coming. Not because this is a bitter church. This is a lovely place to be, truly. But because we bump into one another, don't we? And when you bump into one another, you get bruised. I was cutting a hedge yesterday. It ripped my arm apart. Hopefully that won't happen here. But you will bump into, you will find some scratches as you relate to one another. There's no way around it. Because the beautiful picture... All the indicatives and the truths that Paul and Timothy set out here are lived out in the real world of relational joy and relational challenge. I've had four teeth out. Not this week, but I've had four teeth out. One up here, one down here, and two back here. I am awful at the dentist. Fortunately, all of my teeth were taken out without me knowing what was going on which is, in my opinion, the only way that dentistry should ever happen in any form. (laughs) The first two I had out one by one uh, under sedation, which is a weird thing, because apparently I was conscious and there and interacting and probably saying a lot of rubbish, and then I have no recollection of it at all afterwards. Then I needed to have these two out. I'm so bad at the dentist that when I had my appointment at the hospital, the, the, the guy looked at me and said, you don't want to be anywhere near this, do you? I said, absolutely not. And I don't know if you'd get this on the NHS now, but he arranged for me to have a general anaesthetic to have two teeth out. That is the perfect way to have dentistry done. (laughs) They knocked me out. I said to the lady before she made the stuff go in my arm, said, this will make me not remember anything, won't it? I was absolutely wanting to make sure I would have nothing to do with it. Don't you wish that there was such a thing as relational anesthetic or relational sedation? (laughs) Can you imagine the sort of situation? You think, I've got to chat to so-and-so. Or I've got to go and see so-and-so. I tell you what, fortunately, in my back pocket, I have some sedation tablets. (laughs) And I, I will relate with them, and they might wonder quite what I'm saying and so on, but I will have no recollection of this at all. It will not affect me in the slightest. But relationships are never pain-free because we bump into one another, requiring costly decisions and painful forgiveness. Philip Yancey quotes another writer who very profoundly says this, despite our hundred sermons on forgiveness, we do not forgive easily. Forgiveness, we discover, is always harder than the sermons make it out to be. And he writes of forgiveness as this most unnatural act. 
Don't you think that's right? When you're hurt, instinct is to get back. Instinct is rarely to forgive. But in the kingdom of God, the wonder is, in Christ's new community, that this most unnatural act is empowered by the most unnatural act. Who would ever think that God would forgive us in Christ? How unnatural is that? The natural thing is that we're obliterated for our sin, that we're condemned rightly under his wrath against our sin. The most unnatural act is that God should forgive us, which in his heart is most natural. But to us, looking at the holy God, we think, God, how can you do that? Doesn't it amaze you every minute of every day whenever you think about it? God forgave you. Every single sin through you doing nothing except reaching out and saying, God, I need you. Past, present, and future. How do we forgive in the kingdom of God? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, sometimes we talk about the devil. There's all sorts of ways to wrongly talk about the devil. But he must be reckoned with. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about a subject. And at the end, see if you can guess what the subject is. At the end, he says, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Anybody know what the context is? Forgiveness. Do you know in churches, one of the devil's, I dare to say this is true, one of the devil's greatest intents is to cause the bumps between you to lead to bitterness and unforgiveness. But we are not unaware of his schemes. We forgive as the Lord forgave us. Now, you might have some working out to do with people. Forgiveness can be a process. It's not a simple subject. I haven't got time to say any more about all of that. But don't let the give the devil a foothold. When you hold a grudge against someone, you are literally opening the door to my heart. Come in, devil. I'm not joking. You are literally opening it. But we're not unaware of his schemes. He wants you to not forgive. He wants you to get bitter. He wants you to bear a grudge. Why would you let him? Don't let him. In the kingdom of God, we clothe ourselves with Christ. In the kingdom of God, we forgive like Christ. I'll ask you at the end if there's any forgiveness needed. Finally, in the kingdom of God, to top it off, Christ is all and in all. Verse 11, here in God's new community, there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. You might want to say, that's a bit of a weird thing to say. In that church, there was Jew, there was Gentile, there was free, there was slave. What Paul and Timothy are saying now is, It's not that being a Christian eliminates all our differentiating markers. It's that those differentiating markers don't divide us any longer. Who came to if you came to the African night the other day? I am I am the least African person in the world. (laughs) I am very English. But hey, that's all right. It's far from perfect. Africans are just amazing, aren't they? I don't know if Africans think we're amazing, but you don't, (laughs) you do not have to comment on that. But Africans are amazing. But I tell you this, there's lots of potential for Africans and Asians and South Americans and South Africans and (laughs) Indians and Polish and so on to be separated from each other because there is so much difference. And yet, in the people of God, those distinctions no longer divide. It's an absolute miracle. Instead, those differences are being woven into a tapestry that glorifies God. And anyway, is where it's all ending up. In the new heaven, on the new earth, where there are People from all languages and all tribes. So get used to it. One writer said this, churches are wonderfully messy. 
They are not organized by an algorithm so that you only meet like-minded people. Church prevents us from simply hanging out with people like us. Committing to a church stirs us out of being self-serving and shapes us into people who are self-giving. Unlike Facebook, church tells us that the world does not revolve around me. Rather, Christ is all and in all. And when Christ is all and in all, we're prevented from making too much of ourselves or too little of others. Let me quickly explain. If Christ is all, then I can't get ahead of myself because I'm definitely not all. I have to resize my importance in relation to Christ and in relation to his body. I am one among many. I'm not all. And neither are you. Because Christ is all to us. And if Christ is in all, which in context means in all of his people, in all of you, then I can't possibly look down on you. How? I might find certain annoyances. How could I look down on a child of God? How could I, how could I look down on someone who is seated with Christ in heavenly places? How can I look down on someone for whom Christ died? How can I look down on someone who is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is a beloved child of God, holy to him? In the kingdom of God, we clothe ourselves with Christ. In the kingdom of God, Christ is all in all and we forgive like Christ. I'm going to ask you in a minute, so stay seated, but I'm going to ask you in a minute to make one decision. Maybe you'd like to close your eyes just to concentrate, think, ask the Holy Spirit. In fact, I'm going to do that for us. Holy Spirit, you have been very present. We ask you in each of our hearts, in each of our minds, Lord, that you will nudge us and prompt us where we haven't been living like kingdom people so that we can make some course corrections, so we can look in the mirror of your word and say, that's the wrong shirt. Jesus would not wear that one. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to read out a list of questions, and there are thousands of others. Here's the simplest thing I know to help you do to do something. From where you're sitting, it's just to stand up. And when you're standing, because even that takes a bit of courage, it's when, when you're standing, it's just to start talking to God. Saying, Lord, you've nailed me here. <laughs> just be honest. He knows anyway. You're not telling him anything. You're dealing with yourself as you deal with God. So I just want to encourage you. Maybe you want to wait till I've finished this list. Have you become a complainer who complains about temples of the Holy Spirit? Have you been avoiding someone? I do appreciate there are exceptions and particular cases for all of these, but have you been avoiding someone out of self-protection? Have you closed your front door to people or closed your heart to people? Is there someone you truly need to forgive? Is there some relational clothing that you need to change? For some of you, it might just be that this lands especially in your outside church context. Well, Paul is talking about the church here. But it might for you especially be your workplace, your neighborhood, your family, your social settings. 
Now, there are no relational perfect people in here. So if I was sitting down there, I would be about to stand and say to God, by your spirit, may I obey the imperatives because of the indicatives. So maybe where you are, if you're able, you just like to stand and just start talking to him. There is no condemnation. There might be conviction. It's very, very different because there is no condemnation. Please don't feel forced to stand. If you know what it is for you, just start talking to him. You have to acknowledge it. You have to repent. You have to receive forgiveness. Do all of those. Keep talking to him. Believe the forgiveness that he promises. And believe for power to change. God, you are amazing. To us, Lord, Christ is all and in all. We pray for power, along with decisions, to live a new life, a new lifestyle, and be a new community. Thank you for this community of people, Lord. They are remarkable. All shapes, all sizes, ages, backgrounds, interests. And you're weaving us together to be a community through whom God shines forth. So we pray, Lord, be glorified. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as we relate together by putting on Christ, forgiving like Christ, and having Christ as all and in all. Amen. <laughs>